My name is Alexandra Matvichuk. I'm head of the board of Center for Civil Liberties. It's Ukrainian human rights organization. And I have an honor to moderate today's discussion, personal sanctions, visa bans, what else? The effective response of the West to human rights violation and strategic corruption. I myself and a lot of human rights colleagues around the world fight for human rights for years. And we know for sure that one of the main enemy of human rights is total impunity. So today we will discuss how to fight with this enemy, how to fight with total impunity with such kind of instrument as personal sanctions. And we will discuss it together with our distinguished panelists. I'm happy to present uh, today with us online, Bill Browder, head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign and author of Red Notice, Viola von Kramon Taubadel, member of the European Parliament, Natalia Kaliada, strategic director of Creative Politics Hub and artistic director of Belarus Free Theatre, Paul Massaro, policy advisor of the Helsinki Commission of the US Congress, and a little bit later to the studio will join me my colleague Ilya Zaslavsky, a research expert at the Free Russia Foundation. And we will start our panel with the keynote address from the Eric Woodhouse, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions in the US Department of State. Good afternoon, good afternoon and good evening to those in Kyiv. My name is Eric Woodhouse, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions at the U.S. Department of State. I'm pleased to address all of you today at this important dialogue on the place for sanctions and visa restrictions in combating human rights abuse and corruption. The U.S. government has numerous tools to counter these types of harmful activities, from foreign assistance to bilateral engagement, there are many programs and policies to help root out endemic corruption that may not be as visible as public sanctions or visa restrictions. Last week, President Biden released a national security study memorandum on the fight against corruption that for the first time establishes combating corruption as a core national security interest of the United States. We all know that corruption chips away at the foundations of democracy, steals from citizens, and empowers those seeking to undermine the rule of law. Implementing this memorandum will lead to bold, decisive action to combat global corruption and will make it harder for criminals to move stolen funds through the U.S. and international financial systems. While we continue to pursue all avenues in our anti-corruption work, I want to focus my remarks today on one particular tool, the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program. The Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program, which is managed jointly and through close coordination by the Departments of the Treasury and State, authorizes imposition of financial sanctions and visa restrictions in connection with corruption and serious human rights abuse. In its implementation, which I oversee at the Department of State, we are driven by three goals. First, we seek to disrupt and deter serious human rights abuse and corruption abroad. Second, we seek to promote accountability for those who act with impunity. And third, we seek to protect, promote, and enforce longstanding international norms alongside our partners and allies. Our objective is to use this tool to pursue tangible and significant negative consequences for those involved in public corruption and serious human rights abuse. Further, we abide by certain principles as we carry out our sanctions regime in this area. We apply these sanctions globally because human rights abuse and corruption are global issues and we do not single out particular countries or regions. Given the flexibility of our sanctions authorities, we strive to target individuals who operate at all levels of responsibility, examining those that directly engage in serious human rights abuse or corruption, 
as well as leaders or officials of entities whose members engage in such activity. We utilize this tool to address systemic public corruption and serious human rights abuse, such as acts connected to the PRC authorities in the Xinjiang region, or the endemic corruption exhibited by Bulgarian oligarchs and their networks that we designated last week. We also deploy it as a response to particular egregious acts, such as the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and the subsequent designation of Saudi Arabian individuals and an entity connected to his murder. Lastly, we do not see Global Magnitsky or visa restrictions as a substitute for country-specific sanctions programs. The United States has a number of sanctions programs and other accountability tools to combat harmful activities. Often, these tools can be used to address corruption and human rights abuses. This is the case in Ukraine, where we have a number of other sanctions authorities that we use regularly to respond to Russian aggression against Ukraine, as well as to target those who undermine Ukrainian democratic processes or misappropriate state assets. In these situations, we do not see Global Magnitsky as a substitute for those programs. With these principles in mind, we work with our partners at the Department of the Treasury to prioritize actions that will have a meaningful effect in terms of disrupting and deterring human rights abuses or corruption and promoting accountability for corrupt actors and human rights abusers and protecting the U.S. financial system from misuse by these actors. We take time to consider the impact of an action, not only on the targeted individuals, but on the environment in which they operate. As part of this, we also consider how we can effectively exclude humanitarian-related trade, assistance, or activity from our sanctions prohibitions through broad carve-outs. While we are aware that sanctions may cause unintended consequences, we are also committed to working with partners to ensure legitimate humanitarian assistance continues to flow to those who need it. We track the reactions of other governments, the private sector, civil society, and the public as we conduct outreach to reinforce the consequences of doing business with human rights abusers and corrupt actors. As part of these efforts, our Treasury colleagues encourage foreign public officials, financial institutions, and business communities to freeze assets associated with the designated individuals and entities, and to investigate companies and associates that may be operating on their behalf. Ultimately, we hope that our actions move the needle in terms of promoting respect for human rights and combating corruption globally. As I observed earlier, sanctions are but one tool in the toolkit. They cannot and do not operate in a policy vacuum. Our efforts in implementing the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program, just as the case is for all sanctions programs and other accountability measures, are reinforced with diplomatic engagement, foreign assistance, and other appropriate tools. This includes visa restrictions under Section 7031C of the State Department's Annual Appropriations Act that target corrupt government officials. The State Department's recent designation of Ukrainian oligarch Ior Kolomoisky earlier this year has garnered significant media attention in Ukraine and globally. We also designated Moldovan oligarch Vladimir Plahotniuk in 2020, among others throughout the region and across the globe. While combating global corruption is a top priority for the United States, we recognize governments can't do this alone. Civil society's role in exposing and fighting corruption, including through supporting the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program, is incredibly important. Anyone who works on these issues in the U.S. government learns very quickly to appreciate your critical work. Your insight, access, and vantage points provide something we in the U.S. government do not always have readily available. Partners like the organizers of this event play important roles, including providing information for potential sanctions and visa restriction designations, sharing trends on the ground, and helping us build capacity and advocate for justice. Okay. Without reliable reporting on corrupt actors and practices from civil society organizations and journalists, our efforts would be far more difficult, if not impossible. While I cannot be there to join you in conversation today, I'm eager to learn of your insights and welcome further opportunities to discuss the ways in which the U.S. government can support efforts to combat corruption and counter human rights abuse. Thank you again for the opportunity to join you today. Eric Woodhouse just uh, mentioned about uh, Magnitsky Act, and my first question will be to Bill Browder, head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign and author of Red Notice. 
It has been nine years since the adoption of Magnitsky Act. You have been one of the main drivers of this process. Let me ask you, are you satisfied with the way the idea of bringing the individual responsibility for gross human rights violation is being implemented today? How do you assess the impact of such measures and what are the intermediate results of this process? Dear Bill, the floor is yours. Got a mute there, Bill. Unfortunately, Unfortunately we, have we have some, some technical some problems. Uh, hello? Dear Bill, yeah, can yeah, you can switch, switch on the microphone? microphone? Because yeah, we didn't can you hear me? don't hear you. Can you hear me? I've, tr I've just switched on my microphone. Now we now hear you. you. Please, Please go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, good. Sorry about that. And thank you um, for inviting me here to this important gathering. And uh, I was especially moved um, to listen to that speech from Mr. Woodhouse because uh, 10 years ago, before the Magnitsky Act was passed, and I was trying to get a, uh, after the murder of Sergei Magnitsky, and I was visiting the State Department at a much, much lower level, they didn't want to hear anything about uh, sanctions. It was a different world. They, they had absolutely no interest in sanctioning Russia or Russians or anything that might upset bilateral relations. And I was almost kicked out of the office of the junior State Department employee when I suggested uh, banning visas and freezing assets long before the Magnitsky Act was ever in place. And so if you ask me, am, am I satisfied? On one hand, listening to that speech, I'm immensely satisfied and, and, and proud as well that uh, Sergei Magnitsky's sacrifice has led to this global program of targeting uh, kleptocrats and human rights abusers, and it's being used all over the place and having a, a, a dramatic effect. Um, that's on one hand. Um, however, on the other hand, um, I have to say that, that um, in order for Magnitsky sanctions to work, and just to explain it very clearly, Magnitsky sanctions means freezing the assets and banning the visas of human rights violators. In order for it to work, um, it can't just be done by the United States. It has to be done um, by all countries that um, uh, human rights violators and kleptocrats want to visit. And, um, and that, that uh, is, is so far turned out to be a challenge for us because we have Magnitsky sanctions programs in the United States, in Canada, um, in the UK, in the, in the European Union, but it doesn't, it's not always um, uh, consistent. So for example, in the European Union, they can only sanction human rights abusers. They cannot sanction kleptocrats. Uh, we don't have any Magnitsky sanctions yet in Australia. Um, it doesn't exist yet in Japan. And so uh, in order for this to be a, a program that it works and in order for me to feel fully satisfied that the bad guys of the world um, can't find pockets to put their money in and travel to, we need to have this program be uniform around the world and it needs to be implemented uniformly. So for example, in the case of the Bulgarian kleptocrats uh, that Secret Assistant Secretary Woodhouse mentioned, they've only been sanctioned by the United States. <laughs> they, um, they haven't been sanctioned by other countries, and so that needs, to be, uh, that needs to be dealt with. There have also been examples where it has been used by everybody. So, for example, in the case of, of the uh, uh, Chinese genocide of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, all four major blocs, 30 countries, 31 countries, uh, sanctioned these people. And so in that, that, that's, a, I guess, the best example of a case that really uh, has worked well. Um, let me just finish off by, by um, explaining to everybody why the Magnitsky Act is, is so powerful. And the reason that's so powerful is that if a person gets sanctioned um, under the Magnitsky Act, uh, every bank in the world has a database where they collect all information on sanctioned individuals. And the moment that a person is put on the US sanctions list um, and other sanctions list, they get effectively fired by the bank where they keep their accounts. And so as a result of that, um, 
you you effectively, if you're sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act, you become a financial non-person in the world. It's like a financial death. Not only will banks stop doing business with you, um, credit card companies will stop doing business with you. Um, if you apply for visas to any country where you need a visa, um, and they and they do a Google search, they're going to find out you're on a sanctions list and won't grant you a visa. And so it's a horribly punitive thing, and I say horribly in a good way. It's, um, it horribly punishes people who have done very terrible things. And it's turned out to be uh, a tool that that has been very, very useful in situations where um, a, a country itself can't bring justice in, in a situation. And so, for example, South Africa um, had a, a group of oligarchs called the um, Gupta brothers, and they had stolen all sorts of money from the South African government in their friendship with the president of South Africa, the previous president. And the South Africans could never get their act together to prosecute these people. And all of a sudden, the US put them on the sanctions list, and they become financial non-entities. And so from my perspective, it's, it's a very powerful tool um, uh, to, to sort of come back to your question. I'm satisfied, certainly. I'm also I'm a glass half full um, or uh, type of person or a glass half empty, I guess. I'm always looking for the next uh, place where we can do work. I won't be satisfied until every country, every civilized country, every rule of law country has a Magnitsky Act and is using it um, broadly and in conjunction with all other rule of law countries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Bill Browder. And my next question is to Viola von Kramer Taubadel, member of the European Parliament. For some reason, EU global human rights sanctions regime doesn't provide any role for the European Parliament, just as there are no procedure for consulting with civil society. Given the European Parliament's experience in supporting human rights and democracy, does the EES plan to involve it in this process? Will clear guidelines be developed so that NGOs can provide evidence of perpetrator of gross human rights violations? How will the protection of NGOs or persons providing such evidence be organized? Dear Viola, the floor is yours. Much, Alexandra, and thanks to everyone who helps to organize this uh, extremely important debate um, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. Um, well, indeed, um, as Bill Broda has rightly said, that um, the consistent uh, consistency of the EU sanction regime uh, is definitely not sufficient. And this is not uh, only because the European Union, uh, the European Parliament is, is not uh, involved, neither are um, any central um, NGOs uh, being uh, included or involved or consulted, uh, but it is definitely also because we have a very heterogeneous, let's say, situation of, of interest of, of different head of states. It was not easy even to implement that, uh, and that's why it has more loopholes uh, than, for example, uh, the U.S. one. And also, I would say, um, when you look at the negotiations currently uh, with uh, and above uh, Belarus, you see it took us more than four and a half months to uh, finally and come to a conclusion only after this terrible state of act by Lukashenko after this <clears throat> hijacking of an airplane, but all the other terrible incidents uh, which uh, happened before uh, and were created and um, produced by Lukashenko and his, uh, his bandits uh, were not sufficient uh, to come to a swift and coherent and robust uh, reply from the European Union. And that shows a bit uh, the situation where we are in. We have definitely some of the member states, uh, for example, Hungary and, um, and also some others who are very much reluctant when it comes to um, yeah, serious responses in terms of Russia or other oligarchic or um, kleptocratic states. Uh, Bill Browder has mentioned Bulgaria. Uh, so we will never find a situation uh, when you need uh, unanimity 
that we as European Union put sanction on one of our member states. This will be terrible, um, terrible, um, difficult. But uh, nevertheless, that's why we are more than, uh, let's say, dependent on uh, the leading role and uh, the role of, of the US in that uh, sanction or in this implementation of sanctions. And I do hope that in the case of Belarus, in the case of Ukrainian oligarchs, we at least try to find a more or less common line on this. Even we are later, we are smaller, we are fewer. Uh, but nevertheless, in the end, I hope we can at least find a joint, um, a joint approach. Uh, yes, with the ESS uh, and the member states, it is not easy why the member states do not want any kind of a mechanism, automatic mechanism. They want to uh, negotiate and to decide and to vote on each and every individual case. Um, we, uh, I'm a member of the INGA committee. This is the committee on uh, foreign interference on uh, democratic um, elections in the European Union. Uh, and even there, now we discuss countermeasures um, on uh, external, act uh, external uh, actors who interfere in our democratic uh, processes and we have the same situation that it will be very difficult to have like a list of criteria when the ESS can implement automatically sanctions against those who uh, interfere in our democratic processes. So it is a very difficult and a very lengthy uh, debate uh, when it comes to the a European Council, that means all the 27 member states um, finding a, a joint solution. But as I said, uh, we will not give up. We will start and we will fighting uh, for a more swift and a coherent reply, especially when we have uh, dictators right in our neighborhood as we face it now with uh, Lukashenko. Thank you very much uh, for the complex answer and I would like to invite to our discussion Ilya Zaslavsky, research expert at the Free Russia Foundation. Uh, dear Ilya, I have a rather complex question uh, for you. Uh, since the occupation of Crimea and over the past seven years, the West has imposed a number of sanctions against the Russian Federation for both armed con aggression and mass human rights abuses within the country. But what is your personal attitude to the choice between personal sanctions and sanctions against the country? How does the Russian society perceive this sanctions pressure? Do you share the views that the imposed restriction didn't hit the economy as hard as they allowed the Putin regime to strengthen itself by mobilizing the population against a so-called external enemy. Dear Ilya, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Alexandra, and thank you to organizers for this great event uh, uh, and these great questions. Uh, I personally think that uh, sanctions that were imposed on Russian aggression uh, uh, against uh, Eastern Ukraine and uh, against uh, and in terms of annexation of Crimea are not enough. They just deterred uh, Putin and the Kremlin from further aggressive actions, but they haven't changed their policy. However, these sanctions uh, managed to at least temporarily prevent further aggression, and they did reduce. Uh, resources available to Putin for his aggressive policy. So the policy hasn't changed, but the dictator has uh, less resources available, including for his military. Um, as for the choice uh, between uh, personal sanctions and, uh, as you mentioned, uh, sanctions against the country, uh, I would not uh, define uh, uh, industry level sanctions as uh, sanctions against the country necessarily. Uh, if they are, you know, uh, properly um, 
uh, strategized and if you if you implement them correctly they may still hit uh, the industry level sanctions can still hit the leadership of the country the cash flows but not necessarily the people um, and personal sanctions are obviously um, uh, useful and working only if they're implemented not superficially but fully if they go after not just uh, you know bank accounts and visa bans but if they uh, if they really go after the network around an individual, if they uh, mon if they are monitored properly and they uh, st prevent the person like Rottenberg brothers, who have been avoiding uh, sanctions uh, imposed directly on, the on them through relatives and then through friends and then through proxies, and it's a constant uh, game of uh, c uh, cat and, and, and mice, uh, you know, uh, catching uh, evasive activity uh, to uh, circumvent sanctions. Um, so uh, my overall conclusion on uh, sanctions, uh, personal sanctions uh, imposed so far against Putin's oligarchic network is that not enough personal sanctions have been implemented and they haven't been uh, enforced uh, perfectly. I think a better enforcement is still possible, both from the United States and European Union. As for your question on um, Putin's ability to mobilize population uh, around the idea that any personal or industry level sanctions are not, not just against the Kremlin and him, but they're against Russia. Uh, obviously, uh, Putin's propaganda is very effective and uh, a lot of resources are being, uh, uh, this is probably the only properly uh, financed industry in Russia or even overfinanced uh, the propaganda machine. So people in Russia, inside Russia, are indeed brainwashed and uh, many started to equate uh, Russia with Putin and Kremlin. And so when, when uh, sanctions are imposed on Putin and Kremlin and specific oligarchs, and they're presented as you know, anti-Russian, some people agree with that. However, I would not, you know, say that the whole Russian society agrees with that. There is definitely uh, a big opposition uh, in, in um, cities, in uh, um, uh, emigre communities, uh, in uh, diaspora. But also, I think there is a large uh, uh, percentage of population with, uh, who are just tired of propaganda, tired of brainwashing, and uh, they are lukewarm. They are lukewarm to this uh, notion. They are neither for Putin nor against him. Uh, they don't care about sanctions. So it's not an ideal position, but it's not something that uh, Putin's uh, propaganda machine wanted to achieve. Um, final point on um, you know, Putin's ability to uh, create this image that external enemy is attacking Russia through sanctions and um, you know, compensating uh, by uh, driving oligarchs and these various officials to, to, to his uh, control. I would uh, not uh, overestimate this uh, uh, idea, I think, uh, and development. I think um, Putin uh, has been abusing Russian resources and giving it to his friends with sanctions or without them. And his ability to mobilize uh, oligarchs and criminals uh, around him uh, is not based on sanctions. It's based on compromise, on uh, collective gang uh, responsibility, as I call it, uh, on mafia rules that he employs uh, in his circle. And uh, they are afraid of him and they depend on him not, uh, I mean, sanctions could be a factor, but it's a secondary or tertiary factor. The main fact is that his security services are following these guys, bugging, him, bugging them, uh, any step out of the line, any sign of disloyalty is uh, uh, punished severely. And uh, there is no private business. There is no uh, market economy in Russia. Uh, so everything is based, all this business of people around Putin is based on tax favors, on special attitudes from the state and government to their uh, businesses. So uh, in, in a way, even before sanctions, Putin has already showed us that um, 
the system is based on anything but free market and, and, and actual commercial interest. So I wouldn't worry too much uh, in the West about uh, that factor. What I would worry about is, yes, we need to uh, invest more in countering disinformation, both inside Russia and outside. Uh, we need to work with diaspora. We need to uh, uh, show, we need to implement sanctions that are really hitting this circle around Putin and Putin himself. And if we can, we should try to implement industry sanctions that are not hitting, you know, salaries of common people as much as they hit the actual cash flows of oligarchs who receive profits. I think that's actually possible. And the example with sanctions uh, in Iran and Belarus over the last decade show that when carefully thought through, this uh, industry level sanctions can actually uh, not only reduce resources available to the po uh, aggressive policy, but can actually reverse aggressive policy to some extent. Uh, overall, I encourage uh, Western policymakers to widen personal sanctions, include in, uh, enforce Kremlin list from Kaatsa, Countering American Adversaries for Sanctions Act, and uh, not just uh, sanction three or five uh, actual oligarchs, but uh, step up the number to 300, for example. That would really send a message to Putin and uh, his uh, criminal bodies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilya. And uh, the next question uh, to Natalia Kaliada, Strategic Director of Creative Politics Hub and Artistic Director of Belarus Free Theatre. Worse than the capture of the plane with the Belarusian journalist Roman Pratasevich, probably is the only a video where Roman, with obvious traces of tortures, voices the text written by special services. How do you assess the coordination of efforts of different countries to impose, impose sanctions against the Lukashenko regime? At one time, Belarus was a third country to circumvent sanctions against Russia for a number of products. Which countries now support the regime with policy of non-interference? And do you share the fear that sanctions no longer affect the situation in Belarus and only push Lukashenko into Putin's arms. Dear Natalia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Uh, of course, the uh, matter of our gathering is not that uh, happy one. Uh, and if we talk about uh, Roman and the question about sanctions, how I evaluate sanctions, I guess uh, the answer is exactly there. Because hijacking of the airplane happened only because Lukashenko and his clique feels completely unpunishable. He understands that uh, neither EU, UK, United States uh, do enough in order for him to feel pressure. Also, it's necessary to understand that uh, sanctions have to be uh, put in place not only against uh, Belarusian Lukashenko, but also uh, against Putin and his clique. And it has to be a joint effort. If we talk here about uh, Belarusian situation and why I consider uh, sanctions uh, that are imposed as a complete failure, very simple. In May, July, we provided the strategy to EU, United States, and uh, United Nations and requested uh, to have preliminary sanctions put in place as before the 9th of August uh, elections in 2020, uh, there were 1,000 people who got arrested already. So uh, it was a very clear message uh, to all the democratic uh, leaders of the world that it will be a major uh, violence against people in Belarus. But uh, right before the 9th of uh, August, I got reply that uh, we even already prepared a letter of condemnation because we expect that elections will be falsified. That's a reply that you get from politicians because uh, they've been dealing with summer holidays and yes, of course, with COVID, but uh, it's necessary for world leaders to deal also with global issues as dictators. 
Uh, then we got to the point of three rounds of sanctions that been absolutely symbolic uh, and allowed Lukashenko simply to regroup uh, and nothing else. Uh, the third round of sanctions that took place in December uh, was a shock for Belarusian society because, uh, again, it was at the very symbolic level. We provide information to Brussels uh, outlining how uh, Lukashenko money bags work. Uh, explaining how they have to be sanctions, and it's necessary to sanction all money bags at once. It's not necessary to sanction one person and expect that something will get changed. Lukashenko system of money bags, the whole Lukanomics, is built up as a mob, as mafia, that is very liquid one. And if you sanction one person, then it means one thing, that all those assets will be transferred to family members, to other names, and they will continue to work. So uh, if we talk about American situation, we have Belarus Democracy Act since 2006, how to freeze assets, how to have visa ban, uh, and uh, for now, uh, we are expecting America to put sanctions in place, but tough sanctions in place. Uh, that includes uh, money backs of Lukashenko, that includes uh, Russian propagandists. For that, we need a new executive order that we've been pushing even with Steven Biggin he was, when he was still at his place. Uh, and with George Kent, that they insist on new executive order that have to be put place uh, by White House in order it will include the ability to sanction businessmen supporters who may not have committed human rights violation or election fraud. They must include Russians, oligarchs, they must include disinformation angle. Those were not at the 2006 version. Treasury, who has all the information that I personally passed, uh, and all money backs, the whole system, how it works, but nothing is happening. They're very slow. The reply that we get, we're understuffed. So while we are dealing with the major dictatorial issues of hijacking airplane, uh, with Russian propaganda, with Russian interference into all possible levels of life all over the world. And clearly, they currently work together, Lukashenko and Putin. Still, we get the answer we are understaffed. EU suddenly uh, decided uh, to move from their uh, four step strategy, uh, wait and see, uh, a pragmatic equal equidistant, decisive continued downgrading of, rela uh, of relationship, a near total freeze, uh, freeze of the relationship. Till the hijacking of the airplane, EU was at the stage wait and see. The question is, for what to wait and what to see? 35,000 people got arrested. For today, we have more than 500 political prisoners. Only 4,000 cases are submitted to UN on torture and rape. And nonstop, we get from Brussels one particular question and the idea, give us a more trigger. So I guess uh, hijacking of the airplane is enough of a trigger to understand what we've been saying for 27 years of dictatorship, when our friends who got kidnapped and killed in 1999, whose bodies are not found, those who did that, they're still in power and they control the whole major violence now in Belarus. For 27 years, we are trying to put all necessary financial and economic sanctions in place in order to stop that. Unfortunately, we made the same uh, situation, wait and see. So the question is uh, whether EU is ready to face what is already happening. Lithuania stopped four groups of immigrants because Lukashenko promised last week that he will floor Europe with refugees. Currently, Lithuania increased double border control twice and requested EU to get frontier service in order to help them to control immigrants. So the question is, uh, whether when we talk about uh, Belarus, uh, pushing Belarus into Putin's hands, uh, for 27 years, this is the status quo. European Union non-stop repeating itself, saying that uh, Belarus is under control of Russia. For 27 years, we have people who get arrested, who get kidnapped, killed, 
and we continue to have that red herring uh, situation. So what EU must do, not only EU, UK, who just included finally into Magnitsky Act um, the uh, unit how to sanction and how to freeze assets of money bags, uh, and United States, they must join, uh, move as a joint front uh, in terms of human rights and put human rights first, not business profits. And they need finally to put their fear of Russia aside or otherwise exactly what will be happening next time, they will be ready to shoot the plane, not just to hijack it. So the question what EU, US, UK wants to continue those conversation or act. Thank you very much, Natalia. And um, a, a small announcement that uh, Viola von Kramontauwaden has to leave us earlier. So I'm really grateful, uh, Viola, for participation in this discussion. And uh, now I have a question to uh, Paul Massara, policy advisor of the Helsinki Commission, the US Congress. We are faced with the following tactics of Russian companies in Crimea. When they get on the sanction list, they create subsidiaries with different names and calmly continue their work. Therefore, in addition to the impose of sanctions, it's very important to comply with the sanctions regime. If there is a periodic review of how sanction works or how other and which other instrument we can use in this regard. Dear Paul, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much. It's really wonderful to be here and really terrific panel. Um, I think the first thing I'd say to that question is, you know, way back to the beginning, you know, do what Bill says. We need other countries to adopt this, this sanctions platform and this, this sanctions mechanism. It's going to be a lot harder to do this if we have full coverage. So it's really important that we leave sort of no rock unturned, no safe haven. Uh, for this for this stuff. But um, to, to speak more broadly, I think this kind of gets to the need for a full-on paradigm shift in the way that we see kleptocratic cash. Um, this is easy because there are just all these anonymous vehicles available, anonymous financial vehicles. It's easy because there are enablers all over the place willing to help out with this stuff. Um, so this kind of gets down to the, to the real meat and potatoes reform agenda. Um, last Congress, and, and this was probably discussed at some point today, it was huge news uh, last December, uh, the Congress banned anonymous shell companies in the United States, which are, of course, behind so much money laundering and sanctions evasion. And I think that that's really what this question gets down to is, what are we going to do about sanctions evasion? And of course, sanctions evasion is very closely related to money laundering, because that's what you're doing usually. You're laundering your cash so that you can get around these sanctions. Um, so this comes down to the need for a fully transparent and accountable global financial system. And that's going to take some really serious reform. And that means it's going to take Congress to, to act even further. Of course, uh, the abolishing anonymous shell companies in the United States is a huge step. Um, now we are pushing very strongly for uh, executive implementation of that. That's what we're waiting for now to get this rule in place. Um, in the EU, there is the fifth money laundering directive um, that also requires uh, beneficial ownership transparency. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they have a public beneficial ownership uh, registry available, although there's there's sorts of issues with all of these. Um, for example, in the in the EU, enforcement remains uh, a pretty significant problem, and there was recently some great reporting on who's implemented and how, and 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 where we're still lacking. And then, of course, there's the issue of um, of enablers, as I'd mentioned, where you have basically this entire industry of individuals, gatekeeping individuals, which include lawyers, accountants, auditors, whatever else who happily take dirty money um, to set up these subsidiaries, these shell companies, all this sort of stuff, um, and makes it impossible to really enforce sanctions like you want to see them enforced. Um, so it's very, it's very, very difficult so long as there are no due diligence obligations for these enablers. It should not be OK, either normatively or legally, for these individuals to take dirty money. They should be shamed in their peer group, they should be shamed by the populace, but then also it should be very much illegal. They should be scared that um, that the cops are going to come after them. Um, and currently in the United States, the only industries, the only institutions that have to do any sort of due diligence on their clientele are banks and then a handful of title insurers in certain cities, but absolutely nothing for lawyers, lobbyists, uh, 
accountants, auditors, whatever. Um, some other countries have this in place, but are very poor at enforcement. The UK, for example, um, has it in place, but rarely enforced. There's a great TI UK report on this uh, called At Your Service that I very much um, recommend. But in any case, this reform agenda is really critical to stop sanctions evasion, which is why we just recently last week announced the formation of a counter kleptocracy caucus, a caucus against foreign corruption and kleptocracy uh, in the United States that will focus on working on a whole host of reform um, uh, uh, initiatives, many of which are going to be announced over the next uh, over the next few weeks. We've we've labeled June counter kleptocracy month. Um, will be uh, we have a we have a Twitter handle at Klepto Caucus and, and and so on and so forth. So we're having a lot of fun with this. Um, what you need to do, you need to build a, a fun bipartisan platform to fight kleptocracy, and that's what we're doing. Um, but be on the lookout uh, for a whole handful of bills coming down the line uh, that will address a lot of these issues because it really is a, a reform issue too. So we've talked a lot about enforcement here and, and, and enforcement is extremely necessary and so important, but we also need to get the legal and financial system in a place that we have transparency, accountability and responsiveness, um, which is which is gonna be a huge challenge. Um, and, and I think that was exemplified by the passage of beneficial ownership transparency in the United States. The last reform had been uh, the Patriot Act in 2001. So this was 20 years later, and we're still waiting for the implementation of many parts of the Patriot Act, such as um, real estate professional um, um, AML, anti-money laundering obligations. So real estate professionals are in fact supposed to be covered under the United States. And it's well known that that real estate in the United States is a, is a, is a huge end destination for dirty money. Um, so I'd, I'd really request that you all join us at the, at the, at the launch of the Counter Kleptocracy Caucus on June 10th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun, it's this Thursday. Um, and then finally, one tool that hadn't been mentioned that I do wanna mention because it is all about targeting um, kleptocrats is good old fashioned law enforcement um, and extraterritorial criminal law enforcement by the DOJ uh, and civil asset forfeiture. So Igor Kolomoisky, of course, has faced now three civil asset forfeiture claim, claims in the United States uh, for his properties uh, allegedly purchased with dirty money uh, in Cleveland. Um, and the kleptocracy initiative at DOJ has just done a fabulous, fabulous job. And we really need to see other countries adopting similar models uh, where we have cops that are dedicated to recovering dirty money that's been hidden in the country. So that's one last thing I kind of want to give a shout out to. DOJ was, did the Department of Justice has been way ahead of the curve in the fight against kleptocracy. That was back in 2010 that they started the kleptocracy initiative. Um, so it's really, really important that we think about the, the role of law enforcement as well. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, dear Paul. And um, we know that sanctions should be one element of the strategy. But do we have the Western strategy for Russia, for China, for Belarus? Uh, I will ask her to answer Ilya Zaslavsky and then Natalia Kaleda to this question. Dear Ilya, please. So the question is, uh, do we have enough sanctions, uh, right? Uh, do, are they working? Um, and uh, my, my uh, it, it, uh, overall question is, uh, uh, we have uh, good intentions in place. We at least have some, you know, uh, elementary unity uh, uh, um, among Western policymakers that, you know, something needs to be done. So, but uh, the acknowledgement process is still uh, lagging behind. We need uh, not just this symbolic uh, unity. Uh, we need... Um, uh, realization that this is um, that uh, this um, um, kleptocracy led by the Kremlin in Eurasian region. That's how I would formulate it. That uh, Russia is really driving corruption throughout post-Soviet space, but now also uh, uh, globally, um, from uh, uh, South America, Venezuela to Eastern Europe to. Um, interfering in elections uh, in all major democracies, uh, including through cor cor corrupt channels. So uh, this question is existential, and that's uh, existential for liberal democracy in the West. And so I think uh, only after acknowledging this, uh, we would go to uh, realization in the West that we need sanctions implemented 
for example, against Russia on the same level as were implemented against Iran. So with Iran, it was clear to policymakers in the West that it was an existential question because otherwise they would get, you know, uh, nuclear weapons that, that could reach uh, U.S. allies and possibly be uh, used against the U.S. itself. Uh, and that's why we really had uh, proper, uh, really high level uh, uh, sanctions, including a ban on uh, oil and gas experts, uh, um, double technology, a uh, ban of Iranian banks. Um, so yes, we, we're still uh, uh, way, way behind that uh, with Russia. And I don't know what else, I completely agree with uh, Natalia Kalida, what else should Putin and uh, Lukashenko do for the West to wake up and to uh, realize this is an existential question uh, for liberal democracy in the long term. But uh, apart from sanctions, obviously, uh, it, sanctions is not the only policy. Uh, we need, uh, as, the, as a unified West, we need an updated containment strategy. Uh, we need to contain uh, mafia state, which employs intelligence uh, 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 channels, employs a global financial uh, network. We need containment that blocks all these different channels and parts of cryptocracy uh, and expert of cryptocracy. So uh, many of these measures would include, uh, 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 you know, counter countermeasures. Uh, uh, everything that Paul Massara described, uh, you know, stop anonymous uh, offshore companies, stop this ability to throw money uh, to and to undermine democracy in a legal way. But I would also, uh, at the end of my comment, uh, really encourage uh, positive steps as well. Um, we really need to step up people-to-people uh, -people contacts. We have to uh, fight for Belarusian youth, for Russian youth, for other post-Soviet you know, uh, young people. Uh, we, we have to really fight for Ukraine. Ukraine is, uh, uh, is an important ally of uh, US. Uh, it's an important ally of a European uh, liberal model. Uh, uh, but also, it's an important uh, litmus test for the whole, the rest of uh, post-Soviet space. If Ukraine succeeds as a liberal democratic state, then Russians and other uh, post-Soviet people will, will have um, um, a beacon to, to look at uh, and to follow. Uh, if uh, Ukraine is allowed to, to, to fail, then uh, everyone will be depressed and... Uh, everyone will think that the West is weak and uh, uh, there's nothing to do. So um, there is a, almost, I would say, uh, a, a, a personal uh, democratic interest of each Western country to, for Ukraine to succeed. Uh, and finally, we should fight for Russian-speaking diaspora throughout the world. Because if you leave it untouched and you just allow it to... Uh, be on its own, trust me, Putin will insert his uh, propaganda machine and will employ uh, Russian diasporas, Russian-speaking diasporas in every Western countries. We saw that in Germany, where a disproportionate percent of Russian-speaking population supports uh, alternative for Deutschland. And I could give you zillion examples like that. But um, so to answer your question, we need both aggressive and cooperative measures in this upgraded containment strategy. Thank you, dear Ilya. And uh, the same question, do we have the Western strategy for Belarus? I will address to Natalia Koleda. And because we are running out of time, I will ask her to keep your answer short. Dear Natalia, please. Uh, there is no strategy. Uh, we understand that, again, I would briefly repeat that it's 27 years and uh, we get to the same, same place uh, where we were uh, 27 years ago. Unfortunately, people continue to be uh, tortured, killed, uh, and uh, nothing is happening. The West continues to express only condemns uh, and concerns. But uh, we got to the point that uh, there is no time for condemns and concerns. And it's exactly what Ilya Zaslavsky is saying. Uh, started from uh, last March, uh, we talk about existential crisis. It's about death and life situation. And uh, 
Ilya is talking about if Ukraine will succeed. And uh, when I'm talking about our situation, I say that use Belarus as a pilot project, establish democracy there. Clearly, people uh, in Russia will stand up because we already saw that Belarusian model working in Russia when people started to stand up for Alexei Navalny. When we manage to get rid of Putin and Lukashenko, we will manage to stabilize Ukraine because the war will be over. We need to talk about geopolitical not. It's not possible to resolve one country and think that everything will be stabilized. We are talking about the geopolitical not. If it's not resolved, there will be no stability in Europe. There will continue uh, that Russian interference. Besides, we could say that dictatorship is contagious. And we saw the last four years in the United States how Trump is acting. We see what's happening in the UK with Russian interference report here, but no reaction by the UK government. So the question is about uh, democracy. And it's exactly what we felt uh, last year and continue to feel that it's exactly complete failure of uh, uh, democracy and liberal values. Uh, we are left alone to deal with dictators. And uh, it means one thing that uh, now we could expect uh, that people will be continue to be killed and the West will continue to uh, release their concerns and condemns. As 49ers coach uh, of San Francisco said uh, to his players, don't tell me, show me. That's exactly the thing. Uh, show me that you are able as democracy to move as a joint movement, not just continue with consents. Do it now, act now. Uh, thank you, Natalia. And my next question is to Bill Browder. Uh, we uh, in Ukraine are fighting for seven years to release so-called Kremlin's hostages. Uh, I mean 105 political prisoners in Russia and occupied Crimea, as well as more than 200 civilians, hostages and prisoners of the war in the occupied Donbas. According to your large experience, what you will advise us uh, to do in this regard? How we can effectively to use this leverage of personal sanctions in order to um, influence to the situation? Dear, Dear Bill, we didn't, we didn't don't hear you. Please switch on your mic microphone. As you, as you rightly point out, um, the Kremlin takes hostages like any crude um, kidnapper would for uh, effectively criminal reasons. And um, your experience, the Ukrainian experience with hostage taking is very much consistent with uh, Kremlin hostage taking in many other scenarios. Um, Putin is a criminal, he's a mafia boss, and he's a thug. And the only thing he understands is raw power. He understands when, when there are consequences for his actions. And so Ukraine needs to, um, like any other um, victim of hostage taking, and there are so many others, there's American hostages right now and in Russia as well. There's, um, uh, there's several American hostages. There's hostages of all different types. And the only thing that one can do is raise the price um, for Putin to be taking those hostages. And what does that mean specifically for Ukraine? Well, one thing Ukraine can do, which Ukraine hasn't done, Ukraine doesn't have a Magnitsky Act. I've been trying um, for a number of years to get Ukraine to do a Magnitsky Act. And, um, uh, you know, Ukraine, should, before going begging to uh, other countries for help, Ukraine should have a Magnitsky Act and have the exact same people uh, that the United States has sanctioned on their Magnitsky list. That would be a good start that you can do internally. Uh, but in terms of fighting Putin, um, he's, he only understands one thing, which is consequences and uh, personal financial consequences. And so the best way of dealing with this situation is to create personal financial consequences for him. What does that mean? It means creating personal financial consequences for oligarchs who look after his money. And Alexei Navalny made it very clear who these oligarchs are. When he went back to Russia, he, get, he made a list of 35 oligarchs who are effectively um, sitting in front of Putin's money or financing his regime, and that's a good place to start. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, we will start our round of inclusion remarks. 
and I would like to pass the floor to Paul Massaro and uh, ask him to conclude discussion, but also to touch upon one tiny question, not tiny, but direct to him. Apart from sanctions, what other effective tools are there to put pressure on regimes that grossly violate human rights? Dear Paul, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I mean, I, I'm always emphasizing just what an embarrassment of riches for reform there are in this space. We've really left the barn door open for 30 years. There's dirty money, there's uh, co-opted, you know, former Western officials, there's co-opted, uh, uh, you know, enablers all over the place. And I mean, it's just, I, I, I've, I've sometimes said, you know, the, the, even in its diminished state, the amount of influence that Putin can yield in DC and, or, or London for sure would make Brezhnev blush. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking about a completely different world here where uh, dirty money and that sort of uh, networked corrupt influence um, is just huge and can actually result in, in policy outcomes such as the lack of response to Belarus, the lack of response, the lack of response to, to I mean, I, to Belarus, to, to Lukashenko pulling a plane out of the sky, kidnapping two, you know, a hundred plus Americans and Europeans, and pulling a, 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 a journalist off the plane with his girlfriend. I mean, that's, it's just like it, 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 it blows the mind that there hasn't been a, 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 a really serious reaction to this. Rather you know, more, as, as Natalia said, better than, better than I ever could, more, more concerns and condemnation, you know? And I mean, all of this is the result of, of these networks that are embedded uh, all over the United States and the European Union and so on and so forth. And it just doesn't take a lot to, to get a veto in, you know? There's just so many op opportunities to veto a smart policy action within the United States or within the European Union and, and or within the UK. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's once these things are embedded, it becomes, the problem becomes, how do we dislodge them? Um, and that's what we really have to do right now. And that is the paradigm shift I'm talking about. That is the, that is the embracing counter kleptocracy as the agenda of the 21st century, as American identity. You know, America has a great history of fighting corruption. You know, and in one sense, it was founded as a, as a country against corruption. It was a revolution against corruption, you know? And I mean, it's, we need to re-embrace that American ethos uh, against corruption, that democratic ethos against what is democracy but an accountable form of government? It's against corruption, you know. And we need to we need to have all this, embrace this, make it the top policy priority. And that is how we are going to solve this because it's going to take a policy change for sure, but it's also going to take a narrative change. It's going to take a take a point where if you're a lawyer or an accountant or a business executive or whatever doing business with Lukashenko or doing business with Putin or doing business with Xi is just not on, it's just not acceptable. It's just not something you do. And, and once we're there, that's when we've really won. Thank, Thank you, Paul. You. And we have one minute per each panelist for concluding remarks. And I will pass the floor to Bill Browder. Okay, hi. So um, hopefully my, my microphone is on this time. Uh, well, thank you for, for organizing this great event. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to be with um, my friends and colleagues on this on this uh, panel, who have all uh, we, we all have different angles towards the same objective. And the objective is that you know we're living in a different world than we lived in 30 or 40 years ago. The you know the Khmer Rouge didn't go on vacation to Saint Tropez, but um, you know the dictators of Russia and Belarus and Kazakhstan and various other places. Um, they do go on vacation to Saint Tropez, and they value keeping their money in in uh, British banks and buying foreign property, uh, buying villas on the Côte d'Azur, and sending their girlfriends on shopping trips to Milan. And we have an opportunity. Um, we have real leverage in this situation, and we have an opportunity um, to use that leverage. And um, as Natalia said, you know, uh, all this talk is just talk. We need to take action. And the action is very straightforward. And, and we know who these people are. And um, I, I really, um, you know, I think we're just at the beginning of the whole Magnitsky movement. And I'm hoping that in time, um, it all becomes harmonized, formalized, and, and very pedestrian, that, that people who do bad things can expect to be put on the Magnitsky list. And it's not even a big deal where, where we even hear about it so much. The only people who hear about it are the ones sanctioned as they're licking their wounds and realizing that they're financial lives are over. And so 
you know, we've it's been 10 years since we started this campaign and and it's accelerated, it's turned into an international movement. And I expect that that um, many more things will happen and many more bad guys will find themselves wishing that this this tool never existed. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And one minute for concluding remark by Natalia Kaleda. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure for us to discuss all of it in all those details in order to make it happen. And uh, with reflections over the last year in Belarus, um, I understand that when world leaders allowed uh, for Lukashenko, Putin to continue their existence, I uh, feel unpunishable. Currently, we got to the point when we need to have, uh, as I call it, a political death from thousand cuts. So we need to put into place uh, an action plan. And obviously, sanctions one of those cuts. But those cuts have to be put in place right away, not getting to the EU strategy, wait and see. Because the only thing that you will see, it's more death and corrupt corruption that will spread all over the world. And we need to insist that business people who are not interested in human rights will invest into civil society. Uh, in countries like Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, in order to build up safe markets for their businesses, even they don't care about human rights. First of all, get rid of dictators, then establish your safe markets. Before that, money are not allowed in. So thousands cuts now in place have to be put. Thank you, Natalia. And one minute for Ilya Zaslavsky for concluding remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandra. And I wanted to praise uh, your conference for being, as I understand, the first uh, uh, oligarch-free event uh, on corruption in uh, Ukraine, which is great. And uh, uh, civil society in Ukraine uh, deserves praise. Without you, Maidan would not have happened. Without you, there would not be check uh, on, on the power. And you speak truth to power, both inside your country and in the European Union. And, uh, in the US and we should, uh, uh, ev everywhere in the West, we should really look uh, uh, to this example and learn from you, not only the other way around. Uh, as specifically on uh, oligarchs, I'm so glad your, your conference is free of this. And uh, to my concluding remarks, get more names uh, sanctioned in the West. And I recently wrote a report, uh, which uh, Kremlin oligarchs uh, Biden administration should sanction and I would prefer to call them Kremlin guards when we speak about Russia, because they're really uh, not independent from the Kremlin. And uh, this would be uh, Alpha Bank uh, uh, Kremlin guards, that would be uh, Trans Transmash Holding uh, oligarchs uh, uh, and others. And with Belarus, it would be Dmitry Rabalovlev, who helped to prop up Lukashenko, and now Mikhail Gutseriev, who is really uh, providing a lifeline to, to Lukashenko and many other names. But we should really uh, stop looking just at these circles and uh, these names which everyone talks about, you know, Rotenberg, Kavalchuks. We should really get beyond this and speak about new names and add dozens and dozens of new names to sanctions. Otherwise, it's, as Natalia said, just concerns and condemnations uh, and frowns. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, unbelievable that this is continuing uh, so many after uh, so many d decades after these di dictators showed their true nature. Thank you and good luck with this conference. I hope it continues. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for the whole distinguished panelists for their essential and important inputs. And uh, I must admit, as a human rights defender, that. In our world, in the many places of our world, there are a lot of people who are not work for human rights. They are fight for human rights every day. And sometimes the struggle, it seems that has no sense because we faced with the whole state machine. But we have to continue our struggle honestly. And the result, even unexpectedly, be achieved. Thank you very much, and we will finish the first day of Democracy in Action conference.